<coughs> you will recall last week uh, that I presented a process that we could uh, describe as the modern construction of the fact. We tend in our societies to think of facts as givens. The facts of nature, we believe, become more apparent the closer we get to nature, the more we open our eyes, the less prejudice we uh, exert in our observations and so on, the more clarity we have in our descriptions. But the account I gave you last week which is the mainstream account, I suppose, today, of what facts are in the sciences, shows a number of key mediations, 11 in all. You will remember the mobile immobiles. You have to take something, you have to preserve it in transport, very much like the Khao train tries to preserve its passengers intact in transport. They mustn't come out the other side in a different form, too different a form to the way they came in. We saw that it had to then get transcribed or dumped or somehow translated into flatness, into a diagrammatic form, a non-3D form, simplified away from the third dimension in which the actual living specimen uh, might have occurred. We then saw that that transcription, if you like, had to be subject to changes in scale. It had to be possible to scale it up and scale it down, make it as small as an anthill or as big as the universe. We then saw that it had to be something which could be easily replicated, printed, photographed, distributed. Um, that it could become an easily accessible something to a number of people. We then saw that it, it <coughs> required to be able to be shuffled, its ingredients taken apart like Lego blocks or Meccano set, and then reassembled in a number of different, sometimes speculative reconfigurations. We then saw that it had to be able to be superimposed over other facts or other somethings that were in the same condition so you could superimpose the New York futures market on the actual suppliers of these legendary uh, pork bellies and so on and so forth so you could have industry, geography, economy etc. superimposable upon one another and connecting in that way, whereas it would be terribly difficult to phone up everybody involved in a sector and ask them how they connect to someone else. So superimposability became important. Finally, it had to have a seamless integration with the written text. It could become an illustration in a textbook. It could become a diagram uh, in a story of some kind and also be subject to geometry. Latour says it's impossible to take out your tape measure and measure the sun but it's very easy to measure a photograph or a silhouette of the sun. And if that changes, you know the sun size has changed. So you have to be able to subject this thing finally to a geometricization or, or to capture it in a geometric language and express the result in, in a geometric language. Well, if these things are all true and we have no reason to doubt them, then a fact is not something which is very close to nature. Here's a tree and a leaf, and the closer I get to it with my magnifying glass and without my prejudice, I look at it and I have a nice empty mind and I just don't have any preconceptions, then I'm closer to the facts. Well, that's not true at all. This thing is just a plant. By the time that plant becomes a, fa a fact of biology and botany, it has to go through 11 mediations, the ones I have just mentioned. The more mediations, the more fact. The more direct, the more confusing. It's just a leaf. How are you going to know what kind of thing it is without the table of comparison, without the superimpositions? How are you going to put it into a species, a family, a genus, a taxonomy? How are you going to describe its elements correctly without comparison? Uh, how are you going to know whether it's typical <coughs> unless you can plot it into a curve of occurrences, sizes, life cycles, etc.? In other words, it's a nothing. It's just a piece of green something flashing in your visual field. You are not closer to the fact, you become more ambiguous every time that you shed one of these mediations. Now, that's not what your common sense tells you. When your friend does something very scandalous and you hear the gossip about it through 11 other friends, 
You think, well, it's a very distorted picture. I better go and ask my scandalous friend to tell me the real story. So we don't tend to trust mediations, but in fact, in this chain, in this network, each mediation translates what it needs to translate. It only takes what it needs from the previous step, and so it refines the story until we have a completely mathematical theory uh, that could encapsulate that story by the time we get here. So there are progressive translations. There are not just mediations, there are actually translations, refinements that happen in each of these steps. Now you might say, rather, uh, why discuss this at all? Why not um, view this as, as some kind of um, you know, curiosity that has to do with the sciences? Because apart from challenging that piece of commonsensical modernist doctrine, which says that there is nature, a unity of facts, and there is humans and society, a unity of humans representing themselves and representing one another in different ways, politically, aesthetically, uh, socially, economically. And here are the facts. Here is nature underlying it. I've got ten fingers on my hands. That's a fact. And I get closer to nature. I get closer to the fact. It's like a storehouse of facts. And this is a storehouse of belief, opinion, action, desire, aspiration, whatever human uh, humans have and filled with quarrels and disputes but here are the facts and when I get to the facts I stop all the disputes we might agree about nothing but we agree the sky is blue well that's not how it is that's how it would be in a kind of modernist utopia of knowledge spelt out in in the 18th century where the world is divided into the human side and in, into the factual side and the factual side is really brought to bear because the human side is full of quarrels and we would quarrel forever. We would not agree on anything unless we could descend upon a fact to settle the matter. Look at court cases. Court cases are actually institutionalized quarrels. There are two sides each trying to pursue a completely different state of affairs, a completely different version of the story. But the judge calls for evidence. And evidence settles the dispute. So it's the same with society. We believe that nature and facts will in fact settle our disputes. We'll argue about everything, even argue about the approach to facts. But once we arrive at the relevant fact, we have to sit back and say, OK, that's how it is. Well, that's not how it is. This image of fact is brought about in the 17th and 18th century because society is so turbulent at that time that it's necessary to put something outside of it that will bring social dispute, that will bring the arguments, the different points of views that we indulge in this cognitive war of all against all, will have to end somewhere. The buck will stop here, and it can't stop here, because who do we trust enough to stop the buck? The kings, the popes, the newborn, the innocent? No. Everyone has a stake in this matter, and everyone wants to see their story prevail. Therefore, we need to create a kind of no-go area of facts, and we agree to stop arguing when confronted with the facts. The facts are what we are prepared to hold in common beyond dispute. Now, those of you who, who may have looked at the Rorty reading, um, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature being Rorty's most famous book, you will see that he deals brilliantly with exactly this scenario. He says that whereas from the 16th century onward, humans no longer believed in some kind of divine uh, rule or concept or, or supervisor to society, humans were prepared to embark on a secular social experiment, they nevertheless believed that there was this thing outside of them called nature and that nature should dictate the structure or the form of their knowledge. Where God had dictated the form of your actions, now nature should dictate the form of our knowledge. And feeling the absence of God in uh, human affairs, we clung all the more closely to nature as if nature could provide us with all of the norms, but in this case, factual norms. If we could find out what we are really like, what is human nature, we could act in accordance with human nature and then, you know, uh, presumably reduce our problems. Now, Rorty shows how this idea comes about under very specific conditions in the 17th and 18th century uh, and a little earlier, and how, in fact, it dissolves. It is not possible 
to hold this idea. And it's not carry possible in the 20th century, at the time of writing, uh, he's writing in the 80s, to, in fact, structure knowledge around the idea of truth, which is correspondence to the facts. Therefore, this falls away as a something. And we have to ask ourselves, where are facts? If facts are no longer in nature, like we ask ourselves, where is Werner? Werner knows where the plugs are. Werner keeps the coffee rolling in the good times. But Werner is not here in nature. He's gone to play a gig. Very unnatural. So like our facts, facts have migrated out of nature. We are not content to believe that they are, are just somehow figments of our imagination along with unicorns, leprechauns, hobbits, orcs and whatever which would be a lazy relativist position. We, we do stake a lot on facts, but facts don't have this gigantic natural foundation. In fact, we cannot even make sense of nature. In fact, relativity physicists and quantum physicists can't agree that they're talking about the same universe. Hawkins, Penrose, all these guys have made their career trying to bring the relativity and the quantum view, the view of the very, very large and the very small together in a unified physics. And no one's quite sure uh, whether it's a success. Uh, so if the cosmologists in talking about the universe don't know whether we're talking about one nature, who are we to come along and say, well, nature it must be somewhere. It's not somewhere. But even without nature, we can have facts that are not merely beliefs or habits or opinions or consensus. And what we looked at <coughs> last uh, Thursday was Latour's account of how we not only create facts, but how we create facts and create a huge social and political difference between what happens at this end of the chain of mediations and what happens at this end. Because at this end of the chain of mediations, if you own the chain, you can derive all kinds of powers and consequences from facts. You have a mastery of facts. Whereas down here, you're not even a fact. You're just something that's likely to get swiped by the chain or coordinated by the chain or commanded by a true knowledge or a factual knowledge or a strategic knowledge coming back down the chain in your direction heading to your town soon. Now you'll say, what do we make of this in relation to architecture? Everybody knows that the Bauhaus, whose uh, uh, curriculum we see behind us, is for many people the epitome, the perfect expression of the modern in architecture. Before that, there were good tries. There were incorporations of a number of modern things that we've come in retrospect to, to think of as essentially modern into architecture, such as by Solomon, with the Chicago uh, um, Carson Pyre building, the steel frame, uh, there was the incorporation, of course, of glass and steel by Joseph Paxton, a very inspired uh, gardener, with the Crystal Palace. There was a new typology with the Crystal Palace, a huge, encompassing, light-permeated exhibition space where indoor and outdoor had become ambiguous. So a lot of the things that we, we, we associate with essentially modern are sort of taking shape in the, 18th century, in the 19th century, and they could have perhaps gone nowhere. They could have just been an interesting one or freak. But the modern, in fact, gets codified, curricularized even, defined, practiced and taught at the Bauhaus between 1919 and 1933 uh, um, in this brief period and across three German cities, uh, Weimar, uh, Dessau and uh, Berlin very briefly. Uh, we see an attempt not only to polemically capture the modern and, and define the modern for programmatic purposes the way Corbusier does in, in, in Paris with his projects and his publications. Corbusier has a magazine and he writes everything in it under pseudonyms. People are still finding Corbusier things under the most outrageous pseudonyms. And of course, Corbusier is a... Uh, 
pseudonym as well uh, for Jean Array. And But Jean Array is the cousin who has the license to sign the drawings, so there, there's this endless ambiguities. But we see Corbusier as a massive uh, um, propagandist almost, trying to capture within his own writing and projects the essential uh, features of the modern. But it's not like that at all at the Bauhaus. They're saying, we have got the modern defined and captured in such a way that any of you can come and study here. And when you've studied here, you come out able to function and produce the modern. In other words, something must be quite ripe by the time it can be curricularized. Massimo Scolari says that, that the university, the curriculum, is the eye of the needle through which architecture has to pass because in reproducing itself from one generation to another, the whole of architecture, whatever we think it is, has to somehow pass through that little eye of the needle into the minds of persons like you. So if we want to know what architecture is, we don't have to go through the whole universe of what architects do. We have to just look at its reproduction in a curriculum. And there in front of you is a curriculum. Well, now there is. And if this curriculum is supposed to not only define or polemicize or hint at or be an example of the modern, but supposed to comprehensively define the modern and make it available to all persons who come and study this curriculum. Then you can assume that the modern has become fairly ripe. It's become something which society, which architecture, which a bunch of people feel that they can reproduce. Therefore, if you look at this diagram, you could expect to find all of the elements of the modern. But when you do look at the Bauhaus, how many of you read about the Bauhaus? How many of you know that it's not just an 80s group? <laughs> um, there are many Bauhauses, you know. But this one, the real dinosaur uh, Bauhaus, uh, in fact, did not propose itself as an architectural movement or as an interpretation of certain outstanding buildings the way Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, thinking and writing uh, proposed itself. It proposed itself as the machine to produce the modern, as a curriculum. But it contains some very strange things because it is telling you that you should indulge in year one, which is the big circle, in the study the elementary study, in other words, there is a basic element, there is an indivisible starting point around form and materials. Somewhere at the bottom of a something, and what I'm going to propose to you is that it's a something which is exactly the same as Latour's chain of fact uh, that we saw last week. Somewhere at the bottom of something, is materials in some kind of specially available simplified state and form. And so you're going to spend a year, or as it says sometimes there, a year and a half or half a year or whatever, depending on how bright you are. You're going to spend a year trying to get to grips with an elementary repertory of forms through an understanding of what seem to be very basic materials. So there is your introduction to the modern. And now to make things even stranger at this level, <coughs> you're going to have to put all this exploration of materials and of form, not into your spare time. You're going to have to encounter it in a certain way. And that is you're going to encounter it through who knows. Who knows about the basic course at the Bauhaus? Who was teaching the basic course? Itten. Itten. Johannes Itten was teaching the basic course uh, initially and wrote a number of manuals. He was so gobsmacked, as the English say, or so puzzled by this task 
that he started endlessly trying to theorize and write up books and curricularize to try and find his way in this problem. He was th thrown in and told, lead a bunch of people to the elements of form and to the elements of materials, as if he were some kind of alchemist. And uh, Itten's books are extremely interesting because Itten himself was not some kind of rationalist. He was, in fact, a hard-line mystic who believed in color being some kind of, of, of key or some kind of intuitive way of understanding nature and experience. And he, his writings are indeed extremely mystical. And of course, he, he calms down later in life. But at the time of the Bauhaus, he was following a certain religious sect and uh, insisted that the students all eat garlic and uh, that they wear a certain kind of funky uh, kaftan and whatever. So for him, he, he, he wrapped this task up in the shape of an initiation. So suddenly you're asked to be mystically initiated into the relationship between form and matter. By means of what? By means of a fine artist who insists that you do drawing exercises of these things, that you discover these things. Not by discovering forms, going out, feeling them, banging your head on them, etc. But by, in fact, learning how to transcribe them, how to choose the essential features <clears throat> of matter. You would be looking at wood, you would be looking at steel, you would be looking at clay, you would be looking at textile, you'd be looking at all kinds of things. But you would be looking at matter, which is the content of all these forms. And from this matter, you would somehow be expected to derive through drawing, through drawn studies, the appropriate form. You would explore matter through form. Now, in our Latourian table on the way to the fact, this is clearly trying to capture some aspect of something down here split it into form and matter so that as form it can be brought over this first step over the line and as matter with the help of these forms it can be brought over the line and expressed how through flatness you want to transport the properties of matter <clears throat> wherever you find it by discovering the appropriate form the way somebody might have a raw gemstone dug out of the ground and you might take it to a brilliant gem cutter and uh, Ruskin has this example where Ruskin says that within different kind of gems there is implicit a particular form of cutting and unless somebody understands that substance of agate or ruby or whatever <clears throat> you cannot cut an emerald like a diamond or etc etc it's not simply a matter of a geometry of cutting it's a matter of, to sound like Louis Kahn, asking the stone what it wants. What do you want to become? And a good gem cutter should be able to bring the form, <clears throat> in the case of gems, a geometrical polyhedral form, <clears throat> out of that substance in such a way that the form seems to belong there. So if you think of that as the sort of exploration that's going on among form and matter, in other words, among the raw ingredients of nature, what we find. We take the matter and we find an appropriate form and we explore the form. <clears throat> They're coming back with napalm this time. <clears throat> they explore the form only on the basis of matter, of substances. And in the basic course of the Bauhaus, you are given a range see, they are not up in the air flying on nature. They're flying on 11 mediations. <laughs> and if somebody forgot one, they'll fall out the sky like this is a space shuttle. <clears throat> it's not the pilots flying them, it's the bureaucracy at its body club. Um, you are thrown into this curriculum. Right? As an initiation, we've seen uh, from Itten's behavior that it, he takes it as an almost mystical 
uh, <clears throat> process where you're supposed to die to your lousy old prejudices and you're supposed to come out reborn as somebody who can immerse themselves in matter and who can, in, from that immersion, come back and draw that matter, encapsulate that matter in a number of appropriate forms. So already you're on step number two. You have transposed something which exists in very different ways and, and in different places into a language of flatness, a uniform language of flatness. Now, <clears throat> that is the basic course. And you might say, <clears throat> how is this the basic entry, the portal to the modern? It seems so unsophisticated. And if you read the uh, reading I sent you, which is Gropius's explanation, Gropius was director of the Bauhaus for a long time, it's his explanation of what the curriculum is about. A fantastic four-page explanation of this diagram, very much in the terms of the 1920s, uh, post-World War I preoccupations. And he says that once you have learned how to establish the form that is appropriate to any kind of substance. Then you can do away with history. You don't need the past. You don't need precedent. You don't need tradition. You simply need to know how to get your mind one-on-one -on -one with whatever substance you're dealing with and understand what potential it has to generate form. And that's it. He says you are working from first principles of nature. Those are his words. So goodbye history, hello nature. Hmm? So in the very words and the very diagram of the Bauhaus curriculum, which is trying to capture and reproduce the modern project for the first time, really, we have quite frank admission that nobody can come to an agreement about architecture. You've got people trying to make the English Houses of Parliament in a neo-Gothic style, and others want a Renaissance style, and some want Balinese, and some want Tuscan, and Aurea Hubert is trying to burn down the Tuscan, and this one is trying to promote the Balinese. Uh, for another Gulf estate and so on. So he's saying this is an absolutely hopeless situation. It's not about style. It's not about precedent. It's not about taste. It's not even about aesthetics. It's about approaching nature in a way which is so direct that when you've got a chunk of nature in front of you, whatever it is, you will be able to divine the appropriate form that it wants or that it contains. Therefore, you are learning to design anything that can happen in nature, you can design. You can bring it into culture, or you can bring it into use by learning to understand the appropriate form. Now the really neat trick in all of this is that he says, who's going to teach you that? Architects? No. They're still hung up with this. Think about Adolf Loos stinging caricature of the architect in Ornament and Crime. Who here hasn't read Ornament and Crime? <laughs> There's a well out there that you can cast yourselves into with a suitable millstone on your neck. Okay, in, 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 in Ornament and Crime there is this portrait, some people believe it's a portrait of, uh, of uh, the Belgian architect, Ach Nouveau architect, Henri van der Velde, where <clears throat> It says, you know, <coughs> the architect has managed to bully <coughs> the client into even having slippers and a pipe and an ashtray and a dog and everything else <coughs> according to the preferred style. And the poor client is supposed to have arrived at this wonderful world um, where everything has been designed for them. But in fact, they've been designed into that world and they're merely a figment of the architect's opinion. Whereas Lewis says that if we go to materials, etc., 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 <clears throat> and we know what the materials want. He says, like an English tailor faced with a piece of well-made tweed, or somebody, uh, a shoemaker, faced with a piece of leather, they will know what to turn that substance into an appropriate shoe or an appropriate jacket. Yes? So, <clears throat> Lewis is making terrible fun of the architects because they are merely based on style and opinion. <clears throat> 
They merely know the history. They merely know about past architecture. What the Bauhaus proposes and says what is absolutely modern is that you leave history behind. You leave society behind and you start with nature. <clears throat> In starting with nature, you do what? You have to mediate it. You can't walk around to a presentation with two big chunks of nature. You've got, you've got to say, you've got to take it into flatness. You've got to make it travel. You've got to make it somehow take essential features, in this case it's form, allows nature to travel beyond nature. To where? Where do we humans in this Latourian picture, where do we make things travel to? The first step we make them travel to is to flatness. There you are, you're drawing pictures on a 2D piece of paper, which capture these studies. Now, uh, if you look at, at the, um, the material studies that were undertaken in the Bauhaus, particularly under, under uh, Josef Albers, Josef Albers, who would then go on to teach Robert Rauschenberg at Black Mountain College in, in North Carolina after World War II, and Rauschenberg, who would then introduce the whole of the world, anything became fair game, including a tire and a stuffed angora goat into the picture, you'll see what a powerful defining strand within modernism. This idea that nature could somehow be through form, through a minimal amount of form, transposed into art and be the very theme, uh, subject matter and content of art. So if you follow the Bauhaus basic course from it to Albers to Rauschenberg, to today where you have a pickled shark sitting in a, a tank of formaldehyde, thanks to that absurd uh, trendy British fellow, uh, Damien Hirst, um, you will see that this argument, that working nature up in the correct way, in other words, making it move out of itself via form, and finding the appropriate form is like finding the punchline as a stand-up comedian. Finding the appropriate form is the real skill. Now, who's going to teach you that? Here is where Gropius is smart, and here's where the, the Bauhaus is smart. Not architects, not engineers. Engineers can teach you how to geometrize the whole thing up there. Architects can teach you how to argue with other architects. It will be the most advanced fine artists of the day, who are not, I assume, these people with their Donald Duck uh, uh, outfits on. Um, these must be poor initiates. You are going to get hazed. The weak from hell. Um, <clears throat> Let me continue hazing you in here. You, you've got a situation where Gropius says the architects are not fit to take this task on. Only the fine artists. But if you read the, the reading I gave you, you'll see that he does nothing but pour scorn on most fine artists. He says most fine artists are absolutely unemployable. You know, they go and study at the academies. They learn certain skills in the academies which are divorced from anything except making easel paintings for a salon. They come away bitterly disappointed because they can't make a success in art because the art academy has misapplied art. It's misapplied art to making what most of us think is art, i.e. pictures on a wall. So he must have another sense of what art is about and that sense of what art is about comes from the most advanced artists of the time, which is the abstract artists of that time. And who does he employ? He employs none other than Paul Klee. Itten himself is no slouch as, as, as an artist. Vasily Kandinsky. Oskar Schlemmer. Lionel Feininger. Piet Mondrian as a guest. You, you could not wish for a better, you couldn't wish for a better lineup of advanced artists at that time. And for Gropius, these artists are very important because they have abandoned this academic ideal of, of creating um, art for, for the salon, pretty pictures. Uh, they have in fact started creating a language of forms that is a laboratory for this process because he says the artists have created extraordinary forms in their work 
that have yet to find their application to architecture and society. So you have this ex amazing idea. I don't know how. One must admire Gropius. He did many silly things, including sleep with Alma Mahler, who was a professional widow of greatness. Um, celeb hunter, you'd say today. Um, but you must admire Gropius for seeing that and for suddenly saying that academic fine arts is degenerate. Here are a few maverick people, and there weren't dozens of Picassos and Matisses and uh, um, Clays and Kandinsky's at that time. Here are a few people who have turned art into an lo active laboratory of form. That's how he reads abstraction. Within art, we say it's abstraction because we don't see a picture of a chicken in a Jackson Pollock, so it must be abstract, it must be something else. But he's saying a picture of a chicken is merely academic, that sells in a salon. This abstract is not just the opposite of a realistic chicken. This abstract is in fact a laboratory process or an exploratory process that generates forms we have never had. And it's our duty to somehow drive these forms back to their application. Now how do we apply them? Not by driving them to society, but driving them back to matter. In other words, they are possible configurations of material. They are possible three-dimensional configurations. They must come out here as what? What's up here? What's up here is the unity of all these processes. Okay. They must come out here as something that's never been seen on the earth before. So, <clears throat> if we look at our recently lost uh, curriculum, We'll see that after a year of this strange immersion in matter in order to elicit form, guided by the leading abstract artists at the time, um, and the basic course is, is by far the most important course in the Bauhaus, you see that it starts to then filter into more focused activities such as the study of materials, what are their properties, etc. The study of nature, what today would be trendily called biomimetics. The study of materials and tools to make the transition between hand skills and industrial skills. The study of construction and representation. And is it not interesting that construction and representation are seen as one process? Imagine if you had studio where you sit exploring representations for years and years, but at the same time you had to be doing your construction exercises, your structures course, um, <coughs> and your basic um, uh, building science in that curriculum, in that same space. Then space study, color study, and composition study. So you can see that these are all th things, as if it were a mine, that have been extracted from the basic course. And what does this correspond to in our Latourian system? Everything that comes out of here comes out onto some kind of format of flatness, simplified into the drawings or the models, that the sculptural models that come out of this thing. And here it gets broken down into elements. You can see the elements over there. And we are invited, once we have understood these elements, to reshuffle them. These are the elements of possible forms. We're invited to reshuffle them and to rearrange them. We're invited to combine what we know about materials with what we know about from space study or color study, or what we know from nature study with the study of materials and tools, or the study of construction representation with the study of materials. Here we have the shuffling and the recombination. And then, as we approach the Holy of Holies in the middle, we are reintroduced to those very unusual things, which would, would be a mistake to call nature or matter, right? Because we've been there. We are reintroduced 
to those strangely artificial objects called glass. You don't find glass lying around, you find silica lying around. You don't find metals lying around, unless you have a mine. You don't find color lying around, it's a pigment, it's always in, somehow on a binder, it's in a liquid form or awaiting something. You don't even find stone li lying around, it has to be quarried by the time it's a potential building material. You don't find wood lying around, you might find trees lying around. And you don't find clay lying around because contrary to what we think, clay needs all kinds of things. It needs to be rotted, it needs to be compacted and who knows what else. In order to make bricks, you don't just dig up the garden and buy one of those handy things from the building expo. Um, <clears throat> so you have these strange artificial objects. Objects themselves that have been the, 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 the product of a manufacturing or a skills or a craft type mediation. They are already artificial objects. They are like facts. So you have again the form and the content distinction. You have this flexibility, this Lego set repertory of forms, if you like, this recombinability. And you have these perfectly artificial. What could be more artificial than a box of pastels? Colors of perfectly controlled hue, saturation, graded tonality by mixing white, certain permanence, etc., etc., to be used on a certain kind of paper whose roughness and edge and tooth and fixability is well understood. What could be more artificial than the materials we use in architecture? And where have they come from? They come from industry. So here you have highly mediated forms encountering highly mediated facts. Highly mediated facts. Through what? Superimposition. Okay. And as we pass on to the center, which promises all kinds of things building, site, okay, testing, design, building and engineering science. Okay. This is what we signed up for, you know, building engineering science. We're going to get there. But nobody ever got there till 1927. There was no architecture course taught at the Bauhaus for nearly uh, 10 years, <coughs> from 1919 to 1927. Because, why? People felt that once you had sufficiently mediated nature, you had made a repertory available of fact. The architectural fact, the design fact. <clears throat> you had integrated crafts, artistic skill, industry through the workshops, industrial production. Industrial production, you're looking for a typical thing. The debate is, is there a typical or a perfectly stable form for a drinking glass or a fork or whatever, what Corbusier calls the objet type. Through these recombinations, you might find the perfect one like the drinking glass you get from the OK Bazaars today, that is a 1920s sort of typical tumbler. And people thought this would be the last glass on earth because it does exactly what it has to do. Um, and so here you have the objet type and this recombination to find the essential properties which are now movable. Let's have a little bit of that thickness, a little bit of that height, a little bit of that roundness, a little bit of that density, a little bit of this opacity, a little bit of that weight, etc. You have a perfect matrix which you then mate to your materials through the industrial workshops by understanding the industrial process. And at the Bauhaus, you understand it firsthand. Every manufacturing process is there. You have a studio master and you have a workshop master uh, who shows you how something is made. And at very least, you make a prototype. Your prototype brings these two things together. It's very easy to then join that to the written text and the Bauhaus produces its own written text. They have their own publication. They have very smart publications <clears throat> which are still uh, reprinted and all kinds of people you know, published under the Bauhaus uh, um, uh, brand or edition because of the incredible integration of factors. They had integrated industrial production, advanced art, craft skills building skills, material science, form, 
And now they were going to move on to building, but building, but architecture was almost unnecessary. Because if you're equipped with all this, you can design anything. You are Bruce Mao and Rem Kohlhaas rolled into one. So architecture would merely be an afterthought. We derive nothing in the Bauhaus from architecture. We assume that architecture is dead and defunct, that it's merely a matter of heated opinionizing. And that we can reconstruct it from nature by going through exactly the steps that Latour tells us every culture that tries to create a fact goes through by putting the same mediations in place. The Bauhaus curriculum is nothing but the circular expression of the typical Western fact. It constructs architecture as a fact. It's very simple. And in the Western ontology, it's as if architecture is somehow coming from nature. And if you allow your historical or your, your, uh, um, your personal conditioning or your sort of regional cultural conditioning to get in the way, that does not help you. It merely blinds you. And that's why you need a whole year of having these scales taken off your eyes, of absolutely exploratory, <coughs> very hippie, delightful work where you can be sort of like Yosef boys and you can plunge into the mysteries of matter and you, you know, if, if, you, if you think about, who knows Yosef boys? Hallelujah. Yosef boys <coughs> is in, in some ways a very direct enactment of the Bauhaus formulation of modernism, of the German formulation of modernism. He wants to work directly with matter. He goes around the gallery with gold dust on his face and a dead rabbit explaining the pictures of the great masters to the rabbit. Uh, or he gets into an ambulance, wraps himself up in felt, gets put in an airplane, deposited in a gallery in New York in a cage with a coyote and he shares the space with this coyote and a whole pile of newspapers. If you have a coyote, it's good to have newspapers around, those of you who have puppies and kittens and whatever. Um, and then he gets crated up again, taken by ambulance to the plane and flown out. So he only sets foot in American soil to meet the coyote, which is a sacred animal of metamorphosis for the uh, Native American people. And that's his statement. But what these statements are would make perfect sense in terms of this level, that outer ring of the Bauhaus curriculum. Or he shows a chair, he gets a nice chair um, and he covers it with fat. He puts a wedge of fat on this thing. <clears throat> and he says fat has these insulating properties. Or he gets a huge centrifugal pump and he pumps honey around the gallery or he covers the gallery in felt, etc. He wants to work directly into what? Color study, sound study, study of materials, all in one band. If you look at Joseph Boys, he, he could almost be perverting. He's almost like the Frank Zappa, if you like, of the Bauhaus curriculum. And, and why? Why is this possible? You can work directly into nature. People thought there was a nature mysticism in boys, but it's not a particularly mystical situation. It's just the belief that your intuition plus nature will produce every form that you could ever want, unencumbered by the narrowness, the bigotry, the traditionalism, the limitations, and the endless human, in, the indecisive human argument around aesthetics. You will go straight to the matter and you'll come out with the ethos, the, the perfect appropriate form. Of course it takes skill, but above all it takes deconditioning. And what could be more deconditioning to, to someone of your age or younger in 1919 than being taught by Paul Clay, Vasily Kandinsky, and Johannes Itten? So, but what is done with all this deconditioning? Nature is made available across its entire range as substance. Substance is seen to be the basis of form. Form allows matter, if you like, to translate, to move into pictures, into diagrams. And the diagrams can get chopped up, partitioned, rescaled, superimposed, integrated with writing, and finally, in this course, mathematized and geometrized. That is why the 
the interim director, in many ways the, the most interesting director uh, um, of the Bauhaus, Hannes Meyer, would only present his architectural uh, project to the client in working drawings. Something which uh, Sir Norman Foster picked up again as a kind of yuppie tick in the 80s. But <clears throat> the, the idea was that Meyer was sitting at the top of this tree. And all he needed to manipulate facts was the sheer geometry and the numbers. They were already available to geometrization. He didn't even need words, he'd gone beyond words. And there was the building in the working drawing. So what I want you to consider is that what we've said about the, uh, the collapse of this nature human, non-human uh, ontology, and we saw before in Latour that these two things pass through each other like warp and weft and transfer properties and qualities to one another very promiscuously. But the, they are, in a way, the kind of uh, holy grail of the modern to believe they can be separated and they can be attained in their pure form. Well, something like that underlies the Bauhaus thinking. But the Bauhaus thinking in going to nature doesn't simply create terrible hippie, uh, corn cob, whatever these things, cob house, uh, uh, straw bale, um, desperately ugly uh, buildings which are like this terrible uh, uh, woman's underpants that come up to here that you buy at Woolworths. The equivalent in a building, that is a green house. And the more de desperately unappealing, the more virtuously green. That's hardly what happens. This is not some sort of hippie fooling with uh, <coughs> organic uh, geodesic domes or some kind of sustainability conference in Cape Town where NGOs want to bat each other out with uh, um, you know, golf clubs. Uh, this is basically the same systematic and very powerful and empowering program that the sciences had been embarking on since the 19th century. In the 19th century, no scientist worth their salt would say they are an empiricist or they're looking closely at nature. They were building sophisticated constructions upon previous facts. Look at all of chemistry. You know, it's an integration of previous facts. And the high-level theories in the 19th century, such as theories of uh, electrodynamics, the notion of a field is not primarily intelligible. It's intelligible against two centuries of the physics of energy and the physics of work. So you're dealing with a very ingrained type of self-understanding of science. So while the Bauhaus might feel that it is, it, is, it, is, it is going to a kind of bedrock situation here, what it is doing is in fact treating this polemically and saying we want to get away from opinion and history, tradition and style towards something which is indisputable. And nature is a good shorthand for talking about indisputable. And the people who have moved around this indisputable stratum the best so far are the abstract artists. They've created a speculative repertory of form. But what do we do with that? We take it into <clears throat> a number of representational skills and formal intuitions. We then bind them in the second ring to a way of varying so that whatever you have to design, you can adapt and vary and join anything in that second ring. And there is your formal repertory for designing anything at any scale. And then we superimpose it upon modern industrial production. We make the prototype and we go to industry and we say, how do you like the rights to that? You make it. So we are a laboratory which includes industry within us, which is perfectly appropriate. Contemporary science, at least in, in the West in the 19th century, includes all the possibilities of industry within it. It's not that industry produces science, it's this way of producing facts makes industry possible. So <clears throat> by the time you get here, all you have to do is give a geometric or uh, a numerical expression to what's already passed beyond image and word. And that's the architecture course. So once you've done all this, you can design anything. And <clears throat> the, the status of architecture, which is the modern status of architecture, this futuristic status of architecture, to come out of the Bauhaus is purposefully left vague. We're not heading towards a certain kind of architecture, away from a certain architecture. 
Once we have mastered all of these mediations, you simply use them to produce an output that is bound to be a properly founded, properly flexible, ultimately highly rational <coughs> architecture that cannot go wrong because to analyze it, you just decompose these steps of its synthesis and if it happens to be a problem there, you fix the problem and you go back up the chain. In a, in a chain like this, the synthesis of the, of the object and the analysis of it, the theory, are simply two different directions of negotiating these mediations that make it up. So architecture is the last translation of this process, the one closest to a geometric uh, language, but it's not derived from geometry. Is it, geometry is simply a filter for that level. So all of this filter through geometry would give you the repertory of modern architecture. And indeed, that's how it panned out. Because the last director of the Bauhaus was uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and you know that van der Rohe's buildings are, in a way, a projection of this diagram, um, <clears throat> and that they are enormously freed, despite what some people may tell you, from the idea of historical precedent. They are so free from historical precedent that they set up a dialogue with historical precedent, but entirely on their own terms. And almost everything you know about modern architecture comes from this process. Now, <clears throat> you, you may know that for some people, um, this was a mistake. And uh, during the 1960s, uh, there was <clears throat> an attempt to consider what had happened to all of this. What happened to the architecture based on opinion, taste, aesthetic, style, the past, tradition, etc.? And here we run into our friend Venturi, who writes a magnificent uh, text that you really ought to read if you haven't read it several times, called Robert Venturi. complexity and contradiction in architecture. How did you avoid reading this and come so far without mishap? And many people have said that complexity and contradiction in architecture is like pop art <clears throat> because it seems to bring in, uh, and in his next book, Learning from Las Vegas, it brings in popular sources, low art sources, non-architectural building types, etc., etc., etc. But the truth is that Venturi's uh, book essentially surveys what happens to this, which is the way of doing architecture from Vitruvius to the 19th century. You became part of a tradition of styles, a traditional repertory. What happens to this once it is cut off from the definition of architecture by the modernist one, by the Bauhaus? We know that the modernist style spreads like a virus that over 3,000 buildings in Tel Aviv call themselves Bauhaus buildings, and in fact, uh, for, from Bauhaus students, and in fact, they are now uh, UNESCO um, monument sites, what do you call them, World Heritage sites, because it's this improbable emergence of this type of thinking process resulting in buildings in the, in the territories, uh, the Palestinian territories. Uh, and then we have almost all modern cities, from Chicago to wherever a modern city springs up to Brazil, coming up in a style that e either owes everything to, to Mies van der Rohe or owes everything to Corbusier. Um, <clears throat> Oscar Niemeyer, Pancho Geddes, etc. There are all the kind of integrators back into the colonial situations of an international modernist style. But what happens to this? this 19th century academic uh, uh, melange, this mixture, uh, well, it tootles along without a pedigree and it becomes the way most people build. Your grandpa, your mom and pop, the suburbs of Pretoria, Vardaklerf, the Balinese, the Tuscan, the whatever. It becomes an insane mixing pot of everything because it becomes the default capturer of this. <clears throat> 
It's like pop music. Anything is fair material for pop music. And anything can combine with anything else in pop music. It's not the case that the most sophisticated composers of the 20th century are the ones combining everything. They're the ones combining the least. They're the ones dealing with the most mediated materials. But as you let go of mediation, so you find a huge historical archive of very mixed materials. And so it was up to Venturi to give a pedigree to this and say that this is an organization that has its own rules, that it accumulates complexity, and that it manages contradiction productively, and that we should look there for something other than the sterility of the situation. And that is very similar to, to the American pop artists at the time, like Rauschenberg, who wanted to dig into life again and stop this uh, autonomy of uh, New York abstract painting and want to start dealing with things which are photographic, which are found, which are contingent, which accumulate together without any uh, overall logic controlled by the artist and so on. And those of you who don't know Rauschenberg, you, you should. Um, and so in architecture, in some, in some senses, what Venturi does is propose a rich mixture that's available for a kind of shaping by architecture, providing no architect wants to get above it. Because there is no above it. Once you create an above, you've got to put it into this process, refine it, mediate it, and that's where the above is. Right? That's where you're controlling all of these mediations. That's where you have the total fact integrating all these mediators. But this thing is kind of roughly what it is. And collage and other issues and juxtaposition and so on and film editing and all kinds of other metaphors start to enter into an architecture. And to some extent, somebody like Aldo Rossi contributes to this by saying that this is actually can also be understood as a set of typologies that have been brought together and interbred and that the city is a kind of selector or user of typologies and so on and so forth. So a lot of 19th century theoretical thinking comes back to try and make sense of this, but it becomes a vernacular, a new vernacular, a new folk art, a new simply available architecture, in contrast to the synthetic, mediated, produced, highly mediated, highly purified architecture. The architecture that comes out here has been through the same steps of mediation as chlorine. Pure chlorine in a vial stands to this, a lump of salt down here sodium chloride. Now these things are still made of lumps of something. This is a lumpy architecture. But it is found to have gone on in the lowbrow business of warehouses, industrial buildings, city planning, cheap speculative housing, uh, any and everything else. And now the, the demand for architects is to get on a par with that and to embrace that and to know how to negotiate it, no longer say, ah, that's merely popular, that's lowbrow, that's kitsch, that's pointless. So by the time the 1960s are halfway through, we have two kinds of architectural foundation. We have the Bauhaus one, which has been massively successful, and we have this new fairly upstart one, which is quite polemical, uh, <clears throat> but which promises a new kind of richness, albeit at the, at the cost of a loss of purity and control. So what we have presented is a cashing in of the claim uh, of the Bauhaus and much of uh, Weimar culture at the time to be zeitlich, neue Zeitlichkeit, the new objectivity, the new factualness. It's not just a style or a fad or a reaction to expressionism as the new subjectivism will now cool down and have the new factualness. This is very literally a new factualness. If we examine the Bauhaus and we examine the conduct of architecture that calls itself modern and that constantly references the Bauhaus one way or another, we'll see that it is factual because it constructs architecture in exactly the same way in which the wider scientific and I must say the wider colonial culture constructs a fact. If we wish to objectify as, as a colonial power this is the chain of mediations we use. So we know what type of resource, thing, person, climate, 
etc. We can turn the earth into a standing resource for our control. And of course, what better way to make something available than as a fact? With all of its handles, each of these mediations is a progressively better handle <clears throat> on the thing you are trying to deal with. So the exactly the path of mediations that creates the modern fact creates the modern architecture. It follows these things with the same fidelity as a sleepwalker somehow. And for those of you who think that expressionist architecture and its, its immediate precursor, which is Ach Nouveau, are somehow less factual or less science smitten or less objective smitten than this explicit modernist story. Think again. Uh, Ach Nouveau is simply biology obsessed and it wants to capture something of the dynamic of living form and of process in its buildings which unfortunately seem like fakes they are the perfect fakes and targets for somebody like Lewis and for these kinds of uh, modernists because there is the same old tectonic in those buildings covered by a beautifully streamlined veneer much like American cars of the 1950s have the same old engine, chassis and everything else but are covered by a rocket ship or jet plane type uh, um, uh, aerodynamic styling. So even though Ach Nouveau is not um, a success, it's, it, it's something of a stage managed presentation of an old tectonic in a new cover that new cover is nevertheless biomorphic and based upon the idea of a life or a vitalism, which is so uh, important at the end of the 19th century. And that, and that is why the lines that you find in Gauguin, those outlines around shapes, or those arabesque lines that you find in Van Gogh, can transfer straight into the buildings of Ach Nouveau. As, as Pevsner pointed out decades ago, being quite close to the fact himself, when one saw a Gaudi building, one saw a translation of this kind of vitality, this fluid arabesque that one sees in uh, Gauguin and Van Gogh holding the whole picture together, a sign of the vital. And of course, expressionist architecture is not so much um, <clears throat> the uh, expression um, of an inner state, a subjective state, but it is an attempt to reinsert architecture into time, into lived time, and to make the lived the foundation of architecture, make the urgency of the present and the virtualness of the present and the emergent reality of the present into the foundation or the center, if you like, of architectural experience. And that, too, bases itself upon what's going on in the sciences, the disruption of time uh, that is happening with the theories of relativity and so on and so forth. The idea that we don't have time, but that there are times, and that, therefore, subjective experience could be a center of one of these times. And so there is nothing really strange to readers of Bergson with his idea of lived time being the authentic time and, and the sort of ordinary clock time being a chopped up cinematic time, he calls it, a kind of less authentic time, there's nothing strange in expressionist architecture to readers of Bergson. So they are already highly inflected. It's not as if there is an architecture that somehow, early modern architecture that's somehow outside of this involvement of scientific or science-like mediations. But the Bauhaus is not simply another science-influenced type thing, the way in which The Matrix is a science-influenced type movie, but in fact goes way beyond the bounds of the real and the possible and whatever, uh, but has a kind of science flavor. The Bauhaus literally succeeds because it does not take on a science content the way in which Ach Nouveau does with biology or expressionism with uh, the, the Einsteinian um, uh, space-time frameworks, but it in fact takes on the way science works 
it works the way the science works. It creates a fact through a number of mediations. And it starts with nature the way science believes it starts with nature. And it reaps all the benefits of contrasting nature to history and the human. And even in its head, it feels it has now found a natural and certain foundation here. And it's turned its back on the confused subjective argumentative foundation here. The fact is it's created a pack of hybrids where the human, the machine, the productive, the material, the perceptual, the formal, the etc. matter all interchange and form hybrids going all the way up in exactly the same way as the scientific fact. So you all clear about how that can happen. Based on last week, this should be a cinch. Now if you go back and you read the various Bauhaus documents, how the, the Bauhaus considered itself and why it almost didn't bother to make architecture. It believed architecture could integrate all the arts and skills and concepts and experiences and etc. and that the various different arts were just scattered until they had this kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, which is up here, but that is more like a total fact. So architecture was an optional extra to the Bauhaus, and in fact it remains an optional extra to any modern architect. We're all perfectly happy to design slippers, or kettles for a lacy, or furniture, or what have you, because in fact it's the same thing. It's the same set of mediations that only happen to converge at the 11th hour. So people say to me, how can you design outfits with the opening of the football? So very simple, same as a skyscraper or a teaspoon. <laughs> now, it's a very unusual position to be in because there is no previous common analytical framework, let alone a synthetic, uh, an education is synthetic, to produce people or produce the ability or the powers to do this. There is no framework which encompasses all the arts before this. The Bauhaus not only captures painting, it captures dance, it captures theatres, it captures typography, it captures advertising, it captures language. <clears throat> it captures anything going at that time. It crosses all kinds of modalities uh, because it integrates them as mediators of a final outcome. There is no other transversal situation except around the metaphor of production of the industrial base that we find with the, the Tumas or the, uh, the Russian constructivist uh, uh, policies or projects uh, for a few brief years after 1917 before they are suppressed. Um, <clears throat> so there is a kind of perhaps case to be made for production, the idea of industrial production as, as a common basis. But the Russian constructivist episode has less of an impact on the Bauhaus than we think. What has real impact on the Bauhaus is not industrial production or the need to integrate crafts and industrial production because that had been effectively done by the Deutsche Werkbund. That had been sort of sewn up by 1907, 1908. By the time Behrens comes on the scene and starts designing everything for AEG, he can de facto make their logo, their corporate branding, their kettle, and their new turbine uh, factory out of a kind of common DNA which is found in the discussions of the German craft tradition and the German industrial tradition. That's all pre-Bauhaus. The Bauhaus, in fact, just incorporates that. What is radical about the Bauhaus, and therefore what's radical about modernity, where we intersect with it in our profession and our situation, is that it absolutely assimilates all this integration to the integration of mediations that produce a scientific fact. This is the path of facts. This epistemological framework and set of discrete methods. Uh, highly constructivist, highly hybrid. It might not be interpreted or experienced in that hybrid way. It might be interpreted as going to that as a foundation. But in fact, it's a very unfoundational situation. It's a constant site of crisscrossing of human and non-human attributes and the transfer of human attributes to non-human and back and forth and back and forth. And that is its value. Now, before we went and smoked, I spoke about what happened to the banished 
Cain and Abel scenario, what happened to the banished architecture, which is the way architecture had been as a kind of tradition of uh, coordinating, understanding traditions and interpretative tradition, an almost kind of Charles Taylor-like scene where architecture is what it is because it has such a privileged ability to interpret its past and interpret what it draws on. What happens to that? Well, that becomes commercial architecture. It becomes speculative architecture. It becomes the colonial stocking fillers that we know today under the names of Vatikloof or Brooklyn in the United States, Brooklyn. Um, and it gets rediscovered as having a certain kind of polemical charm or a certain kind of friction value, like a sand to put in the eye of this kind of modernism, which functions by purification of all the, the processes, which makes something less and less ambiguous and recreates it at the top, just as science recreates nature in the lab, starting from some uh, uh, obscure uh, source at the bottom. So this remains polemical. That remains popular, interesting, and forms the basis of kind of postmodern because it is indeed unassimilable to this. It does sort of suggest two different kinds of architectural language, games, or worlds, etc. But in fact, this one is not in possession of itself. It cannot produce its facts. It cannot synthesize its content. It has to, in fact, remain at a level of collage or meta-collage, etc., or treat the city as its, uh, as its ultimate object rather than go beyond the city to the building, to the thing, to the individual object, which we can synthesize in all its perfection, this nice uh, stainless steel teaspoon based on all of this, with the same authority as we would build a whole city or, or a building. A Michael Graves kettle likes to claim the same authority as a Michael Graves building. In fact, a Michael Graves kettle has much more authority than a Michael Graves building. Um, but you get the picture and you, you understand what is uh, so dramatic about this. It takes in the 20th century Western notion of objectivity and generality and universality, which has been the mainstay of our... Uh, scientific epistemology and also, in fact, of our uh, power, our colonial rule, which also objectifies and mediates and runs up and down uh, this kind of global chain. And that modernism should spread out from the Bauhaus, even though the Bauhaus shuts itself down uh, before the Nazis can shut it down finally. But modernism should simply spread out of this thing and find itself welcome anywhere in the world and have a fantastically good run. Um, tells you that somehow this works. Now, after the attacks in the 1960s and after the kind of losing momentum in the third and fourth generation of modernists, we find an intriguing attempt that I, I think none of you should, should ignore to restart this whole process. We find an intriguing attempt in Italy with Archizum, Super Studio, Manfredo Tafuri, Massimo Scolari, uh, Ettore Zotas, Andrea Branzi, Barbara Radice, all the designers of Memphis. Who of you know Memphis, apart from the place where Elvis died on the toilet? There's something very, very wrong. You know, my friend Krajewski said he arrived from Poland in Krugersdorp at the age of five, took one look at the main street, said to himself, to his tender little mind, there's something very, very, very wrong here. Um, and has never really changed that opinion. Um, <coughs> There is something very wrong with your curriculum and wrong with you for letting it be wrong if you don't know about Memphis. You don't know how Karl Lagerfeld decorated his apartment in Monaco. Well, that's sad. Let me try and help you. Um, the Italians 
who after the Bauhaus, I think in the 20th century, the, the, the Italians in the 60s and 70s and uh, early 80s are certainly the most interesting people to study, to, to try and catch this adventure. Because of course, um, <clears throat> the, the Italians had had um, some extraordinarily successful artistic avant-garde. Uh, the futurists, who not only included uh, um, architects and visionary town planners like Sant'Elia, um, but also included poets, critics, propagandists, manifesto writers like uh, Marinetti, who took this whole idea of dynamism, change, speed, machine, modernity, etc., all the ingredients of the Bauhaus, if you like, and uh, brought them into support of war. Instead of the Bauhaus as the overreaching framework, instead of the scientific fact, the futurists, in an interesting way, and I'm talking about the same time as the Bauhaus, a little earlier, 1912, 13, 14, 15, uh, in fact took the same ingredients which make this up. Modern painting, industrial production, urban life, etc. And made it converge as a justification of war, saying that war brought everything good to European civilization by sweeping away the old. And uh, apart from being very fascinating and influential, and then being very suppressed because they chose the wrong side, they obviously chose the fascists when they got the opportunity, but they form a very interesting repository because they form almost, almost like a kind of little satellite, a sort of counterweight somewhere, an invisible moon that kind of shifts the center of European modernism and the European avant-garde, what these Italians uh, are doing. Um, and it issues forth in, in, in a climate of not only advanced uh, filmmaking, but advanced industrial design, uh, and particularly uh, receptive to advanced architecture. Uh, one needs only think of the rationalist architecture of somebody like Giuseppe Terrani, who can bring to mind a Terrani building, the Danteum, the Casa del Fascio in Como in uh, Tirani's presentation drawings with neatly photocollaged, letter-setted Mussolini standing there and everybody else in their nice black outfits and their jodhpurs. Um, now here is a high modernism coming from the futurists who embraced war. Here you have high modernists. In fact, Tirani is perhaps the most gifted, the most gifted possible extender of Cabusier. There are very few extenders of Cabussier. Most people who extend Cabussier fall in their guava, just go to Brazil or downtown Pretoria. Okay, he's literally a hard act to follow. But somebody who managed to, to, to reconform that space and make it into an original instrument uh, is Terrani. And there is an interesting book uh, written on Terrani that, uh, by Peter Eisenmann and Eisenman, in fact, wrote this book all his life and somehow couldn't get it out. And only when Eisenman decided that he himself was a big conservative uh, <laughs> could he kind of like, you know, write this book and endorse Tirani. But of course, Tirani was not a conservative. He was an avant-gardist who was trying to interest Mussolini in this kind of futuristic, avant-gardistic process of social renewal. And he, he, he got something out of Mussolini. He made the fascist headquarters in Como, and a, a very exquisite building it is. And he got to make the mausoleum, the Freedom Park, if you like, of the Italian national hero, which is, of course, Dante, the Dante Archive, the Danteo. is a massive project of Tirani's. And Tirani is a really fantastic uh, architect. If you look at uh, Eisenmann's House 11, you can see he's only thinking, Tirani, 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 please come and rescue me and take me away from this uh, synthesis of Co uh, early Korb and, and uh, um, Van Dersberg that's running through houses one to house 10. Who knows the Eisenmann villas? 
Yeah, thank you. Hallelujah. There must be on a t-shirt somewhere. Three of you know it. Okay, well, jokes aside, <coughs> Tirani is this important figure, but he disappears mysteriously, presumably murdered sometime during the war. And that's it. Right. Um, and so Italy has had this strangely ambivalent transcription into its own terms of modernism in all the areas all the arts in design and, and particularly architecture, and produced maybe the one worthwhile, interesting successor of Kabusia in the form of Tirani. So Italy, of course, goes through the stage of remorse. It's like those Kubler-Ross uh, seven stages of dying. Who knows the Kubler-Ross seven stages of dying? There you are. You see, you're interested in dying. <coughs> well, somebody took the trouble to teach you <coughs> how to die properly, but didn't teach you. Uh, about Giuseppe Tirani, which is incomprehensible, but anyway, dying is very common. Tirani is very uncommon. So, Italy went through those stages of remorse, you know, um, and it was very contrite after World War II, and it, it, it put its, a great deal of its efforts into brilliant uh, social realist cinema, and it created a, a whole, converted the fascist pro, uh, cinema propaganda things into, into an extraordinary uh, cinematic culture. Um, but everything else was kind of on hold, rationalist, tamely modernist, international modernist type situation. And then somehow the Italians got it into their head to radicalize their design and their architecture. And they did this by restarting this Bauhaus field, if you want to call this field uh, in our curriculum, by restarting it in a different way and starting it against the grain and saying, what happens if we work it top down or sideways? What if instead of treating it as a set of mediations, we treat it as a rhizome? What instead of knitting with it or weaving with it with vertical and horizontal, we in fact treat it as felt and we start to compact its various elements. And so you have what, what must be one of the most interesting experimentations within the terms of modernism, the Bauhaus terms of modernism, uh, to, to take place in the 20th century. And something not only very instructive about this, but very instructive about now, because a lot of what comes from Ettore Zatzas, Memphis, uh, that group, is held up as postmodern. It's held up as proof that there is this thing in architecture, the necessity of something postmodern. Even though if you look at those architects and you look at their preoccupations, if you look at the theoretical writings and the preoccupations of somebody like uh, Massimo Scolari, he is tremendously concerned to rationalize and to comb out and to desnaggle, and he's like an orthodontist, straightening the teeth of modernism. He's not somebody looking for some sort of delicious uh, postmodern, non-modern thing that they can latch onto the way Venturi does. He is somebody who, who is very interested in coming to terms from his perspective with the modern and feels that he's created a window on the modern. In, in no sense is he orthodox modern. So the Italians play a set of variations here. And <clears throat> what's intriguing about them is that they start in this Bauhaus field. They start in a way which is only possible to start in this Bauhaus field. Andrea Branzi says that the only unambiguous success of the modern movement is the chair. Now, if you're a postmodernist, you'd say, well, Okay, that's saying the modernist movement produced nothing but a chair. But he's saying an unambiguous success anywhere is very rare. You know, you come from, in Italy, you come from a, a, a culture of several disasters and of being used to disaster and of thriving on disaster. So he says at the time the Red Brigades are capturing uh, Moro and all kinds of interesting things are happening, he says the only unambiguous success of the modern movement is the chair. Therefore, given this unambiguous success, given that something popped out the top here and is an unambiguous success, we ought to use the chair to reconstitute the whole of this field of the modern ambition in architecture. We've got the perfect chair. 
we need to then create the interior architecture around it and the decor. We then need to wrap that in a room. We need to wrap the room in a building. We need to wrap the building in a city and the city in a landscape. And so you have this very interesting proof, sometimes tongue-in-cheek, but the fact that it went that way tells you that on an archaeological level, on a, on a subsoil level, it is sharing the force field or sharing the determinants of the Bauhaus modern project. And you have this strange exploration starting from the chair going outwards. Now, the very fact that someone can make a gag like that, and this is more than a gag because indeed they carry it out. Uh, the Memphis designers, Ettore Tsatsas, one of the great industrial designers of the 20th century, he uh, gathers a whole bunch of young people around him and they make the most extraordinary furniture, the most extraordinary objects, and the most extraordinary decor. Spectacular, extraordinary, fantastic. A complete rethink of everything. And then they start to talk about a new... They read Deleuze, they think about striated spaces and non-striated spaces and a new kind of metabolism of the city and they take over the very earnest Japanese metabolists because, you know, people say Tokyo needs to move 30 kilometers to the east or whatever, to the west, and then they proceed to do that. They knock it down and then they build going that way. So it's almost like Peter Cook's buildings that walk. So the <coughs> Japanese think of the whole city in metabolic terms. We need a, it's like an amoeba, we need something out there. We'll take something here and it flows there. And the Italians give an absolutely crazy spin on this because they're saying that's the way in which what happens here in this laboratory flows out there. <laughs> they embrace Japanese metabolism in, in a very perverse way with things like the non-stop city and the various exhibitions in warehouses where they simply have an interior with nothing wrapping it. And you, if you can find a copy of this book by, I think it's edited by Bronzy, called The Hot House, you will see an attempt to survey this and, to, and, to, and to, to consolidate it in the different chapters. Uh, the chapters almost correspond to the Bauhaus curriculum. So it, it needs, it's consolidated as a point from which to survey modernism without being modern, but without being postmodern or anti-modern. It is a way of re-engaging modern without the metaphysics of modern. Huh? So, <clears throat> just as uh, one, those of you who, who read Deleuze and Guattari can see their books as a way of re-engaging Hegel without the metaphysics of Hegel. So, there is something very intriguing and very interesting for you to look at what the Italians are doing in the 70s, starting from here going out, but with the confidence that they are operating in a homogenous field. Now that homogenous field did not exist until the Bauhaus put it together in that set of mediations that we looked at just now. And why should that field still be there? Why should it be there? Even though the Bauhaus crashes and the modern crashes and etc. etc. Why is it there? Because that field is not inherent to architecture is adherent to the modern project, both in its colonial dimension and in its scientific fact dimension. The colonial factualizes the globe, and the scientific factualizes bits and pieces of it. So it is, in a way, once you get your head around the notion that the modern is not some homogenous sphere of human, of nature, but once you realize that the modern is a specific way of mediating, and of translating. And the more mediators, the more real. Not the less mediators, the more real. The more mediators, the more real. It's as if the more people who gossip about your friend. Twelve people tell you, repeat the gossip, the rumor. Well, if 22 people tell you, then you're going to believe it even more, because the more mediators, the more real. <laughs> 
because each translation, as you've seen, does something specific. It adds the quality of flatness, adds the quality of scalability, adds the quality of recombinability, adds the quality of integration with print, integration with geometry, etc., etc., etc. So each translation adds, each mediation adds. It's not a distance from something real. It's in fact a distance from something unreal. To produce through this kind of phenomena technical chain uh, something which is extremely real and which we can use to blow up the city. So there's something very <coughs> intriguing in the Italians. Then re-inhabiting that space after it's been vacated by the moderns who, who've lost uh, steam and re-inhabiting that space without critique, without using this idea of the human and the nature and the subject and the object and whatever as their starting point, but simply taking the top of the mediation, <coughs> cutting it down to size and saying it is not the cathedral uh, of socialism, which we see in Feininger's uh, woodcut in the, in the Bauhaus uh, manifesto. It's not the great city of the future or whatever that the moderns talk about. It's in fact the chair. But we've got the chair. Hey, we've got the chair. So if we've got the chair, and the chair is a total success, how do we kickstart? It's like a yogurt uh, starter, you know. Where's the rennet? How do, how do we get this milk to then start to create and restart the modern without critique and we move across this field of mediations and we get some very fascinating things. Of course, it does not go very much far. Then fantastic furniture, fantastic interiors, fantastic objects, fantastic surfaces, utopian proposals for cities and the fantastic uh, uh, paintings, a uh, lifetime of paintings um, uh, by Massimo Scolari that indeed inhabit uh, or, or flesh out or explore the modernist archive post nature and post human. So, do you have any questions? Do you get it? Who has a inner conviction of wrongness here? <laughs> I think that's the million dollar question that you've asked, so, you know, <laughs> a round of applause to you. Um, <clears throat> I think that is really the challenge, is to recognize that we are on a tightrope. We can't just step off this thing, because there's nowhere to step off to. We can only try and change direction on this tightrope. And Certainly, um, for somebody like Habermas, the ingredients of the modern that he sees as the enlightenment legacy of the modern, secular, rationalist, critical, freedom of the individual, the form of the personal being very important, and, and the idea of rights upholding that very important, transparency of institutions, accountability of power, all of the, these ingredients, he sees them as pointing to a restart uh, without substantial idea of a human subject or a human nature here or the idea of an underlying nature which we could possibly understand ourselves through, through, through decrypting nature and decrypting our place in it or whatever as poor Richard Dawkins constantly tries to do in his 18th century way. Um, but he says that we can still use those ingredients multiculturally to form consensus. And to form consensus 
about what we agree on, what we take as real, what we take as future, what we take as acceptable past. And that that consensus must be unforced. So we need to create an arena or a, a space in our society or a resource in our society in which people can come to terms and hammer out what they take as common. It's not inventing reality because it's massively negotiated. So it's almost like taking deliberative democracy. Not just vote for von Black every five years and he comes around and hammers up a poster and then you never see him again. It's a matter of um, social self-management, if you like, and, and of group identity and an almost a very kind of Rortian idea of where practices could co converge, etc. Habermas is saying that if society is just a number of very divergent multicultural practices, it doesn't mean that they have to be at odds with one another. It's possible that, that we can discursively, we can have a, a kind of conversation that mediates these differences and where we arrive at the common. And of course, we're in a world right now where we have the four sort of major religions backed into a corner by one another and trying to define themselves as civilizations and preparing for a clash, a war of civilizations. Um, because they see their only possibility as becoming more and more fundamental. And I'm talking about all religions. Today to say religion is to say fundamental. But there is a great uh, uh, um, essay by Samuel Huntington um, which predicts a future as a clash of civilizations. And civilizations essentially religiously defined. So the core of a civilization is the possible religious fundamentalism within it. Um, so colonial cultures, for instance, Western cultures are essentially Christian cultures, and so on and so on and so on. So the, the challenge for Habermas would be how do we stop these, these postmodern society of complete disparate people who are, are entrenched fundamentalists and don't want to know about each other's existence? Either convert you or I dispense with you. How do we stop this global Hobbesian war of all against all? By, by finding mediations, by finding the commonality in that situation. And of course that's very appealing and interesting because within Habermas' vision of modernity, it is resolutely multicultural, multi-identity, and it looks at the kind of communicative challenges and the mediational challenges in the human. But what in my opinion it does not look at, even though it is highly multicultural, it still is mononatural. It says there's one nature. There are many cultures, but one nature. As long as we go around the world and saying there's one nature and we can compare any culture or any human thing in the world or any history in the world to that one nature as if it were a background, as if it were a graph paper, we are still holding the card of the ultimate objectivity. We're still saying that in anthropology, we look at a culture, we look at, say, marriage rules, but inside that is the nature of biological reproduction. Or we look at, uh, you know, table manners. But inside that is a certain management of what's raw and cooked and so on and so forth. So we naturalize in order to understand cultures. But we're naturalizing against a grid, which is one of our big inventions, mononatural. So while we're mononatural, we can be as multicultural as we like. We're still colonial while we're mononatural. So that to me would be the challenge to, to Habermas. For, for Taylor... Nature, society, everything is something that we have to use to cope, and we're like permanently trying to cope. Whatever we can use to cope, we interpret and we draw it in and we use it. And for Roti as well. So, so in a way, one could sort of gradually dissolve these distinctions, and one could say we're coping in this society, but we've, we've taken nature into part, so we've dissolved these two rigidities, and that's why. Taylor and, and Rorty seem in some sense with their practice-based uh, notion to, to provide us with a, a kind of liberalizing of modernism. They seem to, to be backing off these two very large fundamental entities that make up the modern universe, make up the modern modes of being. But of course the, the, the case that uh, Taylor and Rorty cannot answer is that <clears throat> Taylor explicitly says that the modern, in all its features, is a culture. It's not a sudden 
emergence out of culture. It is a culture, but that doesn't know itself to be a culture. But then how do we stop a situation, back to Samuel Huntington, of several cultures that then insist on themselves and fundamentalize themselves and decide the only way to get along is not to get along, but to overwhelm or convert, whatever. And in, in, in Rorty, he says we have to experiment with this diversity. And if you look at Rorty, he, he has many uh, readings which we'll, uh, I'll put up for you, where he, he says, how do we get by? How do we create the common in a society where we don't have to agree? So it's turning the Habermas perspective around. Agreement is not the criteria. Negotiated universals are not the criteria, and so on. What kind of society, what would hold society together? Solidarity, what kind of social hope, etc., would happen in an experimentalized uh, type of practice? A pl plurality of practices in pragmatism. So, yeah, there's that. Now, why I like um, Latour is that he, he, he's the first one to shift the terrain of engagement, shift the battlefield, by saying we mustn't take modernism's view of where the battles are to be the truth. Modernism experiences itself this way, but modernism comes about by hybridizing. It's, it, is a, it is a history, it is an episode in human, human experience that has hybridized everything on the globe. And yet it thinks itself as a purifying, as building nature as one type of realm and building society multiculturally, etc., as another type of realm. It, it, it thinks of itself in terms of this division. But in fact, it has been a hybridization on, on unprecedented scale. And in a piece like where he talks about fact issues, he's talking about facts and fetishes, he's saying that a factual culture that thinks nature is made of facts cannot but treat society as a sum of fetishes to be critiqued. And another, a very important essay where it says, has critique run out of steam? Have we reached the end of what we can do with critique? He's saying that modernism self-management here which to some extent includes the suggestions of Habermas, Taylor, and Rorty, is sort of like critique. And he says, but in fact what our society really is, is this. It's a set of hybrids and mediations. And therefore, how can we have enlightenment or modern without critique? We need to go back and re-seize the modern without the terms of critique. We need to actually rethink and re-experience it's like that movie of Robert De Niro where he wakes up and like sees Robin Williams as his doctor and that would put me straight back to sleep. But anyway, he wakes up, he gets lots of dopamine or whatever injected in his brain and he's temporarily awake and he says, what's happened to me and where am I and whatever. And so he's got to go back and reconstruct the past 12 years or whatever when he's been asleep. And then fortunately he lapses back into a coma. He doesn't have to decide between Harbour Mass and Taylor and Rorty and Latour. But you do. Now we're saying the modern has been sleepwalking, or at least experiencing itself and managing itself in certain terms for at least 350 years. Uh, but its reality is one of very different of hybridity, and it's very unable to think this hybridity. But of course, architects, architecture can think this hybridity. The sciences think this hybridity. Um, but architecture is in a fantastic position to think this hybridity because it's a constant interchange of human and non-human attributes. It's the place of endless shuttle interchange between these two things. Even though we've been unhandily indoctrinated to think of it like this, and all our architectural theories are basically junk because they, they are trying to uh, give you means to manage what's essentially a massive hybridity, a loom of hybridity, as if it were oil and vinegar. As if there were these two vessels, so that when you're dealing with hybridity, which is what the r really is, you get the impression you failed because you, you're not dealing with these purities. So it keeps throwing out natural utopias lately with, with the whole e ecology <coughs> thing and trying to define a nature as this own isolated non-hybrid condition or throws social utopias, trying to define that as, as something with its own 
internal dynamic and its own realm and commonalities, um, but in fact they don't exist. So you feel totally frustrated when you're dealing with hybridity all the time. What I like about Latour is that he forces one to acknowledge hybridity. And he says, our task is to rethink the modern in terms of hybridity. And that's why I have a certain affection for the Italians, jokers that they are uh, in the 70s and 80s. Kind of almost um, saying, well, there is no end point. There is no social utopia and there is no kind of factual end state authoritative state or defining object or whatever in the modern. But let's go back in the modern, let's negotiate it, knowing that it's like a labyrinth and we're not going to get out. And not having a postmodern pathos about this labyrinth, you know, reality's gone, uh, societies, whatever. Just saying, let's go there and let's see what we produce. And of course they produce, if you look at the Memphis uh, furniture, and if you look at those designers, they produce a spectacular hybridity. They really are getting on a par and creating a vocabulary and terms to, to articulate this hybridity. Think about Scolari, for instance. So <clears throat> they're interesting, but it's, it's a kind of slow awakening that we as moderns and we as architects can engage in this modern discussion through recognizing <coughs> that what we do is always hybrid. We've been very frustrated because of the demand to think it as if it were purifiable, but it is an alloy. And what happens if you purify an alloy? You get two lousy, weak materials. You know, you want that alloy, and you want to build on the properties of these alloys and on this hybridity. And there are very few examples within the modern. Because even though the Bauhaus employs almost to the letter, as I've shown you, in its curriculum, which I, I greatly admire. I mean, time spent at studying the Bauhaus for you is always time well spent. Even though it almost implements to the letter, the structure of Latourian mediations and translations. It nevertheless thinks of itself as putting a new natural foundation into a future perfect society. Redemption of history through design. So it still thinks of itself in these terms. And it's only the Italians who in a strange way sneak in here again, have given up on these two big things because they've, they've seen how those things can get really hashed up from Mussolini to Berlusconi. Uh, and they go back into this space, and they treat it as a space of multiple mediations. And so they display it that way. So if we didn't have Latour, we would have a kind of sense that this is a highly mediated space, and these things are in a way sideshows, not the ultimate goals or criteria for it, uh, and certainly not the theories of it. We'd have that sense from the Italians. So we don't have to stand on our head to be Latourian, but we have to couple the Latourian insight and the Latourian program to a very intriguing situation uh, in the, the Italian. So back to your question. We have to negotiate this field in different ways, and we have to, above all, <clears throat> get rid of the idea of critique. Because as long as we have critique, we think we can establish one point of view as being more authoritative than others or one framework, nature, as being more authoritative than others. And in doing that, we are ventriloquist colonials. Yes. Any other questions? Because... Um, uh, a process such as the, um, the making of fact <clears throat> is able to bring into alignment, into agreement, hundreds of human and non-human allies. Uh, we decide there is... They are right. We decide that there is um, the southern continent. Otherwise, the Earth is unbalanced because all the continents are up here, but no one's had sight of the southern continent. So we get Captain Cook and we enlist all kinds of resources and peoples and knowledges and longitudes and latitudes and who knows what. And we send this guy off and he touches on Cape Town and the Antarctic and etc., etc., um, the Marquesas, Hawaii, 
etc. And eventually he, he gets there. That is a process of enlisting a tremendous number of human and non-human agencies towards one common purpose. And in doing so, we produce the common. Cook comes back and, and he says it is. And we, we, we have a almost cookie and if you like framework for managing and carrying that commonality forward. So you, within that commonality, one can't even have a relativism because the cost of a relativism would mean unpicking the fabric of the alliances. So maybe someone could, but if they've unpicked it and shown some other configuration in its place, they've in a way incorporated all of this in, in, into their foundation. So multiple commonalities are possible, surely, and each commonality sort of emerges from a particular socio-historical context. So, so what I'm trying to ask is how would one avoid relativism in the sense of being able to say this commonality is better than that commonality, or this current commonality has improved on this misunderstood previous commonality? That you, you, are, you are still speaking as if there's some vantage point outside the two that you can then refer to and say, I'm going to find what's going on here and compare this to that. Mm -hmm. right? With the kinds of questions you raise that, that would lead to relativism can only be raised within a commonality. And they will affect it one way or another. So there, there wouldn't be multiple, say, commonalities called physics. There'd be one commonality called physics with many branches in dispute but the disputes would be managed in a certain way in accordance with what else is there and they would develop or they would proceed or they would die in accordance with this path if you like you can think of the commonality as the air conditioned environment in which they can all survive with the space capsule in which they'll survive which is not to say that um you know once we've got rid of these instant commonalities instant commonality in in, in experience human experience or cartesian type of cert certitude or a commonality of foundation in nature where we think we can naturalize everything and understand, explain. Once you got rid of these two things, we, we then have to um, say we don't have everything bundled together anymore within these common frameworks. Not all the science is bundled together by nature. Not all uh, political and social processes bun bundled in the, the human agents. We start to look at what the mode of existence of something like the law or religion or science or engineering, whatever, might be. And these modes might be quite distinct, which is not to say they conflict with one another, but what would they conflict on? They would have to produce one another's phenomena, one another's realities within. But that wouldn't be a conflict. You know, say, say lawyers start to produce something that is otherwise the business of psychiatrists. You, you then have a way of bringing psychiatric testimony into law courts or legal rights into asylums. But they, they don't tear, tear apart their, their momentums, if you like. So Latour's recent work, say, the last 10 years or so, is, is about... What, what he sees as the distinct modes of existence. And there is a fascinating um, piece called Let Us Talk a Little Politics, where he says that the political has a specific mode of existence, not its institutions or its players or its persons, but discursively it creates a certain common and then constantly redraws what is common. Um, <clears throat> and he, he, he says in the most interesting way and the most obvious way to me, that the whole demand for transparency in politics is idiotic. Because if you had transparency in politics, his mode of existence would explode, which is not to say its mode of existence is corrupt or opaque. It's like saying, what if we wanted factualness in religion? Religion is a set of mediations. But they don't mediate facts, they mediate interpretations. You know, they, they mediate past into present. So it's only when we, he, he's saying that a lot of the lethal confusions and the sense that, that there are these big, uh, easy commonalities comes from the fact that, that we, we confuse these modes of existence. And he tries to clarify and tease, tease these things apart in, in an interesting way. So, yeah, of course, relativism is the big 
threat and the, why well, I'm not minimizing your question, it is what has to be addressed. But I, I think it's, um, it's not that we face it as a, like a vitiating uh, consequence once we let go of that. But it is, a, it is a, f a feature of these two things that we think we will face it if we let go of them. You know, they're like controlling parents. Descartes says, unless I have doubt, I have no guarantee that an evil demon or an evil genius is not controlling my perceptions and that I'm not like a brain in the bat. How do I know I'm not a brain in the bat? I'm not in the matrix or whatever. Where's the blue pill in this whole thing? And the blue pill is the point where dispute with himself or self-doubt ends and cannot continue. And that's the cogito ergo sum. Well, Descartes doesn't uh, call to you know his 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 invisible friend in the sky for a bailout. Yes. He, you know, <laughs> he's not like the Lehman Brothers bank, but it, and it, but it, it's not that you know there there can be no presupposition of God in in Descartes. He says, but thank God this process of doubt in some way, thanks to logic. <laughs> you know, he, it's a performative issue. He runs out of things to throw at himself. Yeah. You know, and that's the blue pill. And then he says, how do I get back to, to reality? And he says, ah, hallelujah. Reality is nature, and it's perfectly homogenous. I take this little dot, I reinsert it in nature, and that's the ray cogitans, and that's the ray extensa. Then you have Spinoza, says so no damn difference. Back to God, <laughs> or nature. For Spinoza, the same thing. And so, you know, it's, it's a very fascinating, extraordinary uh, period that, you know, I would commend you to uh, study. And Rorty's book on philosophy in the mirror of nature is an incredible uh, survey of it and right up to the present. But yeah, I mean, these are all legitimate questions. And I, I don't mean to sound uh, flippant. But, you know, you won't, you won't die relativist. <laughs> Any other questions? You're good. Okay, well, Thursday is our last uh, meeting, and uh, I will post some reading for you. And then we will post more reading and create a kind of library view for the year where you can extend these matters, etc., etc., etc. And if it really bothers you, you can then have autumn school or winter school or whatever to get more confused. Anyway, thank you very much.